My guest on the program today is a professor of animal science, a development expert who has varied experience having been involved in education, conflict resolution, election, environment and agriculture at various times and places. He has been a consultant and project team leader on several projects for the World Bank, UNDP, USAID and Nigeria Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. He is the current chairman, board of trustee, National Association for Peaceful Elections in Nigeria and USAID OTI certified master trainer in conflict resolution. My guest was at various times project coordinator of advocacy and intervention program benchmark survey on open society initiative for West Africa. Project Manager, Nigeria Electoral Violence Reports, NEVA Project, Northeast Zone. Consultant Team Leader, Strategic Conflict Assessment Review, Northeast Zone. My guest is a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Animal Science, fellow of Society for Peace Studies and Practice, and fellow of Federal Polytechnic, Nekede Oweri. He has over 50 scientific publications in journals, periodicals, and conference proceedings, in addition to a Roman fermentation model as scientific innovation, and has delivered over 65 public lectures and invited papers in diverse areas of development, challenge, and policy. He is a journal reviewer for many journals, including Nigerian Universities Commission Journal, Nigerian Journal of Animal Production and Science Forum, among others. My guest is a member of board of directors and trustees of more than 10 civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations, and is his, at the moment, the executive secretary of the Tertiary Education Trust Fund, TET Fund, formerly Education Trust Fund, ETF. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Suleiman Bogoro to late edition. Sir, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can we get to know more about you? Well, um, I guess you'd want to know where I come from. Um, exactly. I'm and from Bogoro local government of Bauchi State. I was born and brought up at early stage in Tudumadeyalwa Shandam in Plateau State, formerly Benue State at that time, Benue Plateau. And uh, I started in primary school there and completed it back at home in Bogoro local government, Mwari, uh, transferred primary school. And later, I went to the boys' secondary school, Gendry, um, 72 to 76, and uh, proceeded the same year to the University of Maiduguri. I did my bachelor's degree in agriculture, graduating in 81. And then later went um, 85, 87 uh, to the Amadou Bello University area for my master's in animal science. And subsequently, proceeded to do on part-time basis, even as a lecturer then, Initially, Federal University of Technology, Bauchi, which is now Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa University mm -hmm. of Technology, Bauchi. Uh, after the master's uh, in ABU, like I said, I then were pioneers in PhD work at my university, ATBU Bauchi, 
uh, where I eventually finished the PhD in 1997 and um, rose to the rank of a full professor in animal science in the year 2003. And I remained so until I was beckoned by the federal government to take up the position of executive secretary of TEDFAN uh, April 15th last year, 2014. Uh, well, I am glad to have been there playing my role for the purpose of advancing the cause of infrastructure development and deepening content interventions in our tertiary institutions. Yeah, you are an animal scientist, but you have work experience in diverse areas. How have you been able to cope with this challenge or with this responsibility? Yes, um, sometimes we have, we, we realize that um, the training of agriculturalists uh, appears to be pretty broad. Uh, I don't know if that's the basis or it could be inherent ability for versatility and uh, the desire to expand knowledge beyond my narrow field that sent me out to be engaged in seeking knowledge in other disciplines. Precisely, um, it is my involvement more in civil society work, uh, late 90s, precisely 1998, when I chose to lead the establishment of a non-governmental organization to address key development issues. And in my opinion, even from the name FESPAM, Forward in Action for Education, Poverty, and Malnutrition, um, education was important, granted the challenge of the negative indices about development in my own part of the country, the Northeast Zone. Okay. And, uh, the facts are all there to say that it's the most backward in most competitive indices. And education would naturally be the avenue through which one could uh, support initiatives uh, at all levels, from basic to tertiary, to want to change things. And um, I was happy to have played along uh, my role in that respect. And it gave me the opportunity, interacting with development partners from World Bank, UNDP, USAID, DFIT, etc., uh, Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. At some point, mm -hmm. early 1999-2000, when Nigeria returned to democratic governance after prolonged military rule, um, uh, with some of us that were involved in civil society, we discovered there were challenges of uh, intervening at rural level because of unfortunate um, eruption of violence and conflicts across uh, this country, Shagamu, Lagos, Kano, as it were, and it went on and on. Uh, it was important, therefore, to draft virtually all most civil societies in some works on peace and conflict management. That's how I got involved. And after that, I was happy to use it to also deepen my involvement in the education sector. So I got involved in trying to know what are those issues from policy, uh, the wider context of uh, why education has not moved the way we thought it should move. I got involved at all levels, from the, like I said, basic up to tertiary level. Uh, I would say that's exactly how I got uh, it will okay. be on uh, my narrow field. Okay. A, pa a part of your work on development uh, programs, you also study things about poverty. How will you assess uh, the poverty level in, uh, okay, maybe northeast yeah. of Nigeria and even in the nation at large? What, how will you assess the situation? I tell you, it's, it remains very sad that overall that we are talking of more than two-thirds of the population of this country uh, living beyond the uh, recognized poverty benchmark of one dollar per day. It's, it's very sad. And um, there is relative poverty, as we would always say. In more developed countries, if you understand their context of development, you would know that theirs, theirs is luxury poverty, so to say. I mean, <laughs> while um, uh, the, the, the type of poverty we're talking about, starting with uh, inadequate uh, access to food, uh, I mean, food insecurity, if I would put it that way. I mean, that is bad enough. And uh, with that, of course, you know that uh, d definitely somebody that's struggling to feed himself or herself uh, must have uh, challenges beyond food, uh, shelter and all other needs, education, capacity to fund education around the person or family or community. These are some of the, and for the Northeast, like I indicated a little bit earlier, um, it is so sad, and uh, I feel very bad uh, that my own zone in the country has had uh, a, a presently 
has the worst indices of development, whether it is infrastructure, um, education, call it uh, access to education. And this has little wonder that um, insurgency has found a convenient platform uh, for what has sadly been happening for years now, talking about the insurgency in the Northeast. And it's a reflection of uh, this thing. And in fact, as we are talking, presently, globally, the Northeast could easily be about the very worst in terms of poverty indices. You better imagine that I cannot sit pretty. It, it, I feel very bad about it. And uh, I am ready and I've been involved to do whatever we could to want to reverse those things. And uh, for me, I see and uh, we appreciate the... Uh, I use this opportunity to tell you, you would understand the direction of Mr. President in respect of uh, trying to address not just insurgency, but uh, attempting to reverse some of the inadequacies in the Northeast. Well, I mean, uh, we, we've, we've had a number of key positions uh, considered to the Northeast. And uh, in the past, it were, for instance, if you compare Northeast and Northwest, you were likely to have more political appointments in the Northwest and even the North Central in this part of the country than uh, in the Northeast, uh, indeed, compared to other zones. If we came to intervention, even budgetary allocation for infrastructure, whether it's roads, electricity, water, and all those things, um, Northeast had always been the worst of. And uh, with the unfortunate situation of insurgency, you better imagine that uh, Mr. President must have gotten it right to say, we need to take a second look at this very disadvantaged segment of this country. It's a legitimate focus, I imagine. Mr. President has placed there. And for us who come from that part of the country, the Northeast zone, we have an obligation to our people. Whatever role we can play from our cells of intervention agencies, uh, government, uh, parastatals, um, leaders in our communities, we have responsibility. And I am determined to see whatever I can from my own small angle. Uh, okay, I can see that you're very passionate about uh, this issue. Uh, so aside uh, having uh, allocation to these areas, I mean political uh, appointments to people from uh, these zones, what will you advise to be done other than that to really elevate the poverty level in this area and of course to change the course of the people? Well, first and foremost, the top priority is what Mr. President is doing. And when, for instance, he has planned to see that uh, by the end of this year, uh, government is able to put a stop to the Boko Haram insurgency, um, you, 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 can, you can imagine how expectant we are. And um, Mr. President needs the cooperation of all of us. I always believe that if your finger is, is, uh, is, um, has a saw, uh, the whole of your body is considered sick. I believe that because Northeast is in bad shape, Nigeria is in bad shape. And Mr. President got it right, like I said, by talking about the insurgency. If you want to intervene in terms of development, I mean, only a few days ago, you were hearing about stories of um, a number of villages being t taken back. I mean, uh, some of Iran, uh, the challenges and the skirmishes between the Nigerian military and uh, our uh, strategic partners in the neighborhood, Chad, Cameroon, and all that, with the, with the Boko Haram insurgents. And um, you, you can imagine that it's not possible, whatever we want to do, uh, whether it is from UBEC to want to intervene in most of the uh, schools that have been destroyed by the insurgents. I mean, remember the literal interpretation of uh, Boko Haram uh, to say, look, uh, Western education is prohibited. So maybe some of the elements would have said, look, let us destroy the basis of learning. And that's why it does appear they might have targeted um, schools. And um, the, the, at, at, the, at the lower level, primary and secondary school have been most hit. The same thing with hospitals, almost any infrastructure. I mean, sometimes some of these things are morally indefensible, uh, very sad as it was. But we believe that um, the right approach by government is the political initiative to end the insurgency so that uh, intervention agencies, development partners, the uh, initiative by, by the federal government uh, led by uh, General T.Y. Danjuma in the intervening to 
uh, alleviate the IDPs, for instance, as immediate palliative measures, as well as are going for reconstruction and indeed reconciliation because some of the strategies of the insurgents has been to break uh, communities along um, social li uh, fault lines like religion, ethnicity, and all that. So you need reconciliation element, reconstruction, and all those things. They are very, very important. If that is done, I believe that with the kind of intentions of government, um, it, it, may, it may be in a matter of few years, we will start seeing uh, the region uh, trying to recover and regain its lost grounds. Okay, if I may say, poverty, conflict, and developments uh, seem to be uh, kind of interwoven and you are quite vast in uh, those areas mm -hmm. because even uh, insurgency that we are talking about here is a form of conflict. Mm -hmm. And in Nigeria today, we seem to have conflicts all over the, the country in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Why do you think uh, we found ourselves in that uh, situation? And what is the way forward? How can we have development as a nation with so much conflicts? Thank you very much. Um, conflicts are a reflection of uh, reality of um, elements associated with governance, administration, and leadership. So um, once uh, it's always said, I mean, uh, uh, analysts, experts have made it very clear that where there is inequity, where there is injustice, where there is a wide gap between the haves and the have-nots, where there is uh, pervasive corruption with resources diverted to the advantage of a few in society, I can tell you, you don't have to go far to get conflict. Uh, I would put it that way. I mean, that conflicts are a reflection of reality of uh, skewed privileges resources and indeed very clearly injustice in many instances. You can reflect over the types of conflict over time and I think uh, government has had the responsibility to see what is possible and that is why from time to time there have been conferences, one conference after another. But the, 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 the point is very clear. Uh, this is a democratic uh, government and democracy creates a platform for people to vent uh, through peaceful means. Uh, grievances and uh, I'm aware that even as we're talking um, remember that in respect of the insurgency in the Northeast government has offered um, credible negotiation uh, you know uh, without um, what do you call it kind of conditions that um, I mean uh, um, are not are not possible to meet um, from the side of government and it's the same thing it applies we've seen for instance the Niger Delta agitations some years back, and uh, even recently, I mean, some of the uh, issues in respect of um, Biafra and all that, and the response from government has been, if anybody has an issue, um, please come forward and discuss. I mean, that, that is the beauty of democracy. It gives you the opportunity to express yourself, and I, I believe that um, with this attitude, all forms of um, uh, I mean, by, by way of uh, this affection, as it were, uh, with the system of grievances, they can be peacefully, and um, I would call it uh, resolved, indeed, in a very civilized manner, rather than any violent methods. Okay, so we'll continue with the discussion in a moment, but yeah. we have to call for break now. Mm -hmm. Our program is late edition, and the guest in the house is Professor Suleiman Bogoro. He is the Executive Secretary of Tertiary Education Trust Fund. We've been talking about a number of issues revolving around Nigeria's education system and other development issues. The discussion will continue after this time out. We'll be right back. <music> You welcome back. The program is late edition. As I we're talking about uh, conflicts and um why we have so much conflict and how it has affected our education, uh, our development uh, 
in the country. So what can we do as a nation to, uh, to, to you know, work on these conflicts and resolve them? Is it possible to resolve all the conflicts that we have in the country? Yes, please. It is very possible. And uh, there is history behind this assertion. Um, there is no conflict that cannot be resolved. After all, the worst conflicts in history have ended up with resolution on the table by all parties in the conflict, regardless of how violent they have been. So I believe that uh, ours cannot be an exception. And in any case, we've had a number of uh, conflicts that have been peacefully resolved. I mean, the value-based conflict, for instance, in this country, as well as resource-based conflict. Um, they, 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 historically, they are some of the most difficult. Value base, including uh, identity, uh, religious conflict, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, ethnic based uh, conflicts. Well, uh, as well as, like I say, resource based conflict. And uh, sometimes when people perceive that somebody is trying to monopolize a resource that should be theirs, and uh, all sorts of uh, definitions come into being. Uh, but uh, don't forget the political conflicts. And uh, we thank God that very sadly, Nigeria has unfairly been under military rule definitely much longer than we would have wished in this country, but with democracy now in place. And uh, with recent developments, very seamless transition from the immediate past government when um, uh, an, uh, an incumbent uh, lost the presidency, and uh, accepted it as such, and the incoming president, uh, you know, um, appreciated him, as, and even described him as a hero of our democracy. To me, these are very positive signs. And um, we've seen uh, political uh, contestations, I mean, being uh, peacefully resolved. Um, we've seen a number of governors losing their seats and uh, walking away, accepting the verdict of uh, either tribunals or the courts, uh, depending on what level. And um, there are different dimensions to some of the types of conflict that we've seen. But um, I believe that there is no type of conflict uh, prevalent in this country that has not obtained in other climes in the world and over time. And that it's very possible to resolve them peacefully. We've seen initiatives. Uh, the political leaders are involved, uh, religious leaders, ethnic leaders, regional leaders, call it, uh, with the support of development partners, partners from other nations beyond this continent, and uh, beyond this country and continent. And we, we, we believe, therefore, that there is no conflict that cannot be resolved. And uh, I am very sure that if we take <coughs> a cue from what has obtained in other nations, and uh, we centralize and emphasize the need for tolerance and understanding, even in the face of the challenges. Believe me, we can resolve our conflicts. And I believe one thing, that who says that Nigeria cannot, without uh, involvement of outsiders, resolve our conflicts peacefully and uh, shake hands as brothers and sisters, concede um, things to each other where the need calls for it. I believe it is just the right attitude. There's no conflict in this country that must necessarily see us torn apart. After all, we've gone through a civil war and we know the challenge of it. And um, I believe that where there is understanding, there is justice and uh, equity as much as possible uh, in the system and uh, across this country. We definitely have all it takes to resolve, see ourselves as uh, our brothers keepers and accept the fact that we have a destiny together as a nation under one flag that we are proud of. I mean, take a look at some of these brilliant footballers, barely a week or thereabout ago. Look at these young chaps playing and uh, very happily raising Nigeria's flag. At that moment, you ask yourself, why are we allowing some conflicts to be cloud our sense of national pride? I believe we can overcome them. Uh, it's been said that uh, one kind of conflict in Nigeria is, is uh, it's difficult to resolve because it's uh, based on religion, religion and ethnicity. Uh, what do you feel about that? You said uh, the conflicts we have in the country, it's not difficult from what we see in other climes. But ours, ours is a little bit uh, different because it cuts across ethnicity and religion. Yeah, but I... 
I, I, I remain firm on the position I put earlier. And that is that uh, I remember I talked about resource base and value base, that there are some of the very difficult types of conflict. Go to Israel and the Palestine and all that. Uh, it's an administrator of both value base and but resource base first and foremost. And uh, you, you see it, and uh, if we have it, resource base as it happened, for instance, in the Niger Delta, isn't it? And uh, ethnic and religious ones, as you are likely to find more frequently in the northern parts. Um, but we have examples where these things have been peacefully resolved. I mean, uh, today, for instance, if we take a look and say, okay, we have had unfortunate uh, conflicts in the north. But take a look at uh, Sokoto State, the seat of the caliphate. I don't know if people have cared to reflect. You would notice that there have been much less uh, cases of uh, ethno-religious violent conflicts. Then why can't we pick lessons from there? And a number of conflicts that were threatening this country in different parts. I mean, you go back and you say, oh, we've had Ife Modekeke, for instance, and so on and so forth across this country. A number of them in the uh, central zones, the Middle Belt areas and all that. Um, ethno-religious, as it was, uh, like I said, value-based. Um, they, are, they are very difficult, but I, I, I insist the other parts of the world, different parts of the world, I mean, we've had uh, Britain, Northern Ireland, uh, Republic of Ireland, we know the kind of challenges, I, IRA, I mean, uh, some of them sometimes, even within a particular religion, we're talking about and the Catholics versus the, 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 the Church of England, conflicts that uh, resonate to the center of the heart. Who says that ours is anything different? Definitely history has taught us that they are resolvable and peacefully too. Okay, let's uh, move a little bit away from conflict uh, issues and talk about education, which is very key for our development too. How will you rate the standard of education in the country today? I must say very disturbingly disappointing uh, in the context that it's been sliding. It's been sliding almost consistently. Let me just give you one or two indices. Uh, I don't know if you know that at some point, uh, the first generation universities in Nigeria, uh, talking about UI, of course, UNN, ABU, I mean, uh, UNILAC, and all that, uh, University of uh, Obafemi Awolo, University, University of Ife at that time. Um, you see, their standards were comparable with the very best in the world. Uh, UCH Ibadan, that teaching hospital, at some point, I'm told, was rated among the top ten in the world. So where did we lose it? Uh, it is all because of uh, this thing, uh, the unfortunate um, uh, lesser emphasis placed on education and uh, scholarship and intellectual development, human capacity development over time. Definitely standards have fallen and uh, we know it, it shows. Uh, sometimes even in some of uh, your, your, your media houses, there are times when those of us that are supposed to be learning from some, some things are allowed and uh, we raise questions. And um, I believe that today, if you reflect, even your media houses, you will see, compare what you had at either your editors, your newscasters, or whatever, some few decades back, 30, 40 decades back, compare with what we have now. It starts from the quality of education at all levels, from the basic, the primary, secondary school to the tertiary institutions. And uh, there is no argument about it. The standards have gone down. Uh, it's, said, it's been said that the teachers, the quality of teachers that we have in Nigeria, it's actually the problem. What do you have to say about that? Thank you very much. I believe that um, I, should, I, should, I should, if you don't mind, permit me, look at it in a more um, extensive approach. I have taken time to identify nearly 10 reasons that I believe are largely responsible. I am not uh, I'm an educator, but I'm not a professional uh, educationist, as you would want to see it. But from my involvement in the education sector, today I've identified about 10 factors that I believe are responsible for the fallen standards of education in this country. Number one, I believe that what we have are misplaced societal values and misguided orientation. The mis misplaced societal value in respect of materialism that has taken over. Many years ago, if you went to the village, you are likely to see that after the village head 
or the Hamlet head. The next important person was the headmaster, the teacher. Uh, these days, it's the exact opposite. Nobody even realizes that there is a headmaster. He is not supposed to mean anything. Some other persons are valued over and above. Materialism has taken over. Knowledge is no more valued. That is very, very fundamental. And uh, like I call it, misguided orientation. Once that is the psyche, you don't expect that uh, anybody would bother about standards of education. Secondly, attitudinal change. And I believe that this is from family level uh, to groups, to communities, and at the national level. Uh, attitudinal change, I mean, look at it this way. For those of us in the education sector, and uh, we've been teachers, and we conduct examinations, it is so sad to find out, and the reality is there, that many parents and uh, guardians go to approach uh, examination administrators teachers, exam officers, to influence them, to induce them for their children and wards to pass examination. Mm. You tell me that that's not a societal problem. This is a major problem, that people want to get certificates. Uh, I believe that a major uh, problem overall that is blighted and affected negatively education uh, standards is lack of adequate political will. And uh, to plan and implement realistic strategies. Once there isn't, because if you don't plan well with strategies, you plan, you say, well, over the next uh, five, ten years, like the needs document that we had, um, this is what we want to be done in education. We review social policy, we'll adjust this.